Hello, good evening, students. Good evening, all of you, and uh, I hope you all are preparing yourself for your exams. Uh, so today is the last class for the law of tort. And uh, today we are going to learn about defenses and remedies in tort. Uh, just without wasting much time, because time is a factor, I have directly started the slides. But just to set the perspective, uh, I want to remind you that uh, uh, if you remember, we have already learned defenses when we were learning, uh, you know, the chapter on negligence. But I said there are different defenses. I also sent you um, some points on general defenses under the law of tort. Uh, we are going to just reiterate certain things uh, uh, in our class today. But I uh, thought, let me go through all of it again so that it would be a kind of revision also for you as well as like we are just touching upon the last chapter as well now regarding torts uh, you know tort is a civil wrong now what are the defenses for the person who is accused of committing a tort or in the law of tort he's called as the tort feaser so what kind of defense would he cling to or what kind of defense would his lawyer plead in the court so we are going to learn about that apart from that we are going to learn about remedies now what are the remedies available for the aggrieved party that is the person who is hurt by the tort feeser now that person becomes the plaintiff in a case so what are the remedies for him so one of the remedies we said is the obvious one that is damages and mostly it is in the form of, of compensatory damages uh, also general damages we said there are different kind of damages uh, we said there is nominal damages liquidated damages when we learned about negligence we spoke about damages and we said that uh, there are different types of damages that the court may award in case of you know the wrong of tort or when tort is committed uh, and the damages may be awarded for the damage just note the the way i'm using the words here damages may be awarded for the damage so there is difference between just to remind you what we learned last time the dif there is difference between damages and the word damage damage is to cause harm and damages is in terms of compensation we are referring to compensation so damages are basically the prime remedy in tort actions mostly and most of the times you know people claim damages that is compensatory damages that is the prime remedy that is sought in the courts of law today uh, say, for example, uh, there is a defamation case uh, where someone's, uh, you know, reputation is tarnished. That is one of the torts, defamation. And I remember I told you defamation can be a criminal offense depending upon the jurisdiction and the country. Like, for example, in India, it's a criminal offense as well as it is a civil wrong. So the, a party can bring a criminal case as well as a civil case simultaneously. But whereas in some countries, they say you have a choice, you either file a civil case or you file a criminal case. And in some countries, they say that, no, you, it is just a civil wrong. It need not be necessarily a, a criminal wrong. For example, in Australia, there are some states in Australia which regard defamation as a criminal offense. And there are some states which say that, no, it's OK, it's just a thought. Now, when it is a tort, the question of remedy comes when it is a tort. When it's a criminal offense, of course, there is, again, uh, you know, pecuniary damages, that is in terms of money, punitive damages, in terms of punishment in the form of fines or compensation that may be awarded. Apart from that, there is imprisonment as well in case of criminal laws. But in case of tort, the basic remedy is normally in the form of compensation, so damages are said to be the prime remedy in tort actions. Now, most likely sometimes they can be nominal damages, that is normal damages, nominal damages, uh, and that is very rare. And, um, you know, if 
if you if you say that compensation is a dominant uh, you know action or a dominant purpose of taught actions that means what about the vindicative part of it sometimes the 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 purpose of awarding damages is not just the compensation part but also vindication now what do i mean by using the term vindication it means that it's always in simple terms to put it it's not always related to money that is receiving compensation for the the harm that is caused for example you say invasion of privacy okay invasion of privacy privacy now there is no uh, you know real harm to property done okay this is just invasion of privacy say it's a tort now once privacy uh, you know, is invaded. Now that is in, irre irreversible. So when it is irreversible, it cannot be changed. So how would you compensate for that per for that person? The person says, "No, my privacy is invaded." So how would you compensate? No, like you know, uh, so something, some personal life of the person is exposed to somebody. So how would you compensate? So will money if, if you know if you ask a particular amount of money still the person may not be satisfied so sometimes they award depending upon the reputation of the person depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case they may the court may ask for you know ask the uh, the defendant to pay a huge sum of money in the form of vindication so the purpose sometimes is not always to commensurate that is to match with the nature of the privacy tort but also to consider the factor whether the, the, the harm that is caused is reversible or irreversible. Now, this is something that occurs to my mind always, also about the reversibility factor, that money can always not sort out all issues, but sometimes in law, you can claim compensation in the form of damages or money. Also, in, in like, you know, as a form of vindicating in the form of, uh, as a form of vindication so it may not you know the amount may not undo personal or you know psychological injury or psychiatric injury but however it can compensate maybe some kind of you know somewhere where the person might require some things financially and it might provide some sort of you know solace of peace for the wrong that has actually been uh, caused or whether, you know, for the wrong that has been committed against the person. So the vindicatory effect of damages uh, of, or of avoiding damages also has to be considered. Next is, uh, you know, whether the thought is actionable per se or not. Now, listen to me carefully because all of this is not in the slides. So I'm just talking as it is coming. So I told you one thing is, apart from compensation, the purpose of giving remedy or providing damages in tort is also vindication, okay? Now, apart from that, I'm, I'm talking about thoughts which are actionable per se, that is on the face of it, that, that is, which does not require, uh, you know, any further proof, it's, it's actionable per se. Like for example, uh, assault, somebody assaults, another person a assaults b or in the form of battery a form of assault so or trespass to a land or even defamation for that purpose it's actionable per se on the face of it okay and there are thoughts which may not be actionable per se and it has to be proved that is the extent of damage has to be proved and then the court may award unliquidated damages that is it is up to the court for you know calculating the damages that is caused Next is damages for, you know, emotional or mental distress that is not always considered by the courts and it is not, uh, you know, really written down uh, in a lot of texts. But, uh, you know, there is argument among the legal fraternity saying that even, uh, you know, for emotional distress that may be caused or psychological stress also a person can claim and there are people who are you know contending at that level and they're not always successful it depends upon the courts and it depends upon the judges because normally they look for something that is tangible tangible losses but uh, the question is always about damages which are intangible that cannot be seen seen easily that cannot you cannot really touch or see it directly so like injury to your feelings or you know or injury to your uh, you know your your emotions or emotional distress so you know this is some yet another aspect which is now building on 
like you know in the courts worldwide and they are considering even the psychological part of it and you know damages even for emotional distress uh, so we spoke about damages for emotional distress we spoke about uh, you know uh, thoughts that are actionable per se and we also spoke about um, you know uh, the purpose of damages need not just be uh, compensatory but also it can be vindicative now let's move on further with the slides now broadly speaking damages or you know remedies in the law of tort can be judicial remedies or extrajudicial remedies now i've just put a uh, you know a kind of a caption here or uh, rather it's a maxim it's a legal maxim that to every right there is a remedy that is a, a you know a famous legal maxim whenever there is remedies that are claimed before the law so they say that to every right because there is an invasion of right or infringement of right that means whenever there is an infringement of right or violation of right always there has to be a remedy now in the law of torts broadly if you classify there are two types of remedies that are granted broad classification one is judicial remedies and two is extra judicial remedies now what is judicial remedies as the name itself suggests that means the person has to go and knock the doors of the court to receive his remedy or to you know remedify the problem or the defect or to redress his issue or to solve the issue he has to go and knock the doors of the court to seek the remedy so that is judicial remedy the other part of it is extra judicial remedies now this is an interesting part what is extra judicial remedy the extra judicial remedies are remedies which are conferred by law upon a person automatically and he can you know uh, exercise that particular right even without knocking the doors of the court like for example uh, say that uh, you know there is one mr a and he owns a land oh okay you say that he owns a field mr a owns a field this is the most common example i give and it's all also there i think in subsequent part of the slides say a owns a field and uh, you know b owns some cattle b's cattle just stray into a's fields and destroys his crops so now a has got the right to you know block the cattle from going back to mr b and uh, you know hold back the cattle you know uh, in his land or in his property and tell b see you are the owner of the cattle and so you will have to pay pay me for whatever damages that are caused whatever uh, sorry not damages whatever damage is caused whatever damage is caused in my field so you will have to pay damages for the damage that is caused you'll have to compensate and you will have to pay me x amount and until you pay me i will not you know release a cattle so that is uh, you know the right to retain something with you the right of retaining some uh, like for example yet another example i could give you like uh, probably when you are studying contract you will learn uh, you know bailments bailments so bailment uh, like for example what is an example of bailment would be like you're giving your clothes to a tailor uh, to get your dress stitched to a tailor so when you give to the tailor and uh, say you don't pay the tailor money so the tailor say now you stitch two dresses and then after that you tell the tailor okay i will pay you uh, you know the next week and the other week and the other week and you don't pay and then again there's a third dress and he's kind enough to stitch it for you and then you still say no it's almost three months or four months and you, you still don't pay now the tailor is annoyed with you and the tailor says no i will not release the fourth dress to you till you pay me the money and the material is very expensive his tailoring charge must be you know much lesser than all the three dresses but the material must be expensive and the tailor knows that so the tailor will say okay i will not give you the dress back till you pay me the money so that is that comes under you know bailment that is contract that's a different thing but i'm just giving an example of extrajudicial remedies where a person has got the right to retain the property or something with the person that belongs to another until the other person uh, you know 
discharges his duty or discharges his responsibility towards the person. So the law somehow gives that right to a person and it comes within the purview of law. When it is a conferred right, then such a remedy is called extrajudicial remedies. That's what the slide says. When the aggrieved party has to knock the doors of the court and seek an effective remedy by following the due process of law, then such remedies are called judicial remedies. On the other hand, when the law confers certain rights to the aggrieved party, which will be exercised by the aggrieved party against the tort visa within the purview of law, that means it has to be within the presence of law, within the ambit of law, you have to act within the law. It has to be a right within the law as a conferred right, then such a remedy is called extrajudicial remedies. Now, examples or the types of judicial remedies are, of course, damages in the form of compensation, monetary damages, and so on. Then, of course, there is injunction. You know what's injunction? I explained last time. It's like a cease and desist order. Um, it is uh, like to, it's also called as a stay order in lay terms. Uh, uh, you know, a stay order or cease and desist order injunction, and this injunction may be permanent injunction, or it can be interim or interlocutory injunction, or, you know, there are different types of injunction. Uh, we need not go to the detail of it. I'll just touch upon this a little later, but just for you to know now, injunction that is cease and desist or, you know, stay order, try to recall what we learned during negligence. And next is specific restitution of property that is to you know give the property back to the person now about extra judicial remedies under that we have expulsion of the trespasser that comes under specific performance that is to remove the trespasser uh, you know the one who has trespassed your land to remove the person out re-entry on the land specific performance that is if a person has dispossessed another person to bring the person on the land or in the property or in the house then recaption of goods that comes again under specific performance, abatement, that means, you know, either you uh, ask someone to reduce the nuisance or remove the nuisance, abatement, then there is distress damage fees in, that is the example that I gave you about cattle belonging to someone where the person has got the right to hold back the property, you know, till the person compensates for the damaged crops that comes under distress damage fees. And so these are extra judicial remedies and judicial remedies where you can knock the doors of the court is damages, injunction, specific restitution of property. What are the types of damages? You know, you'll have different types of names, even if you like go to some other textbooks, you'll have different names, but you know, practically and you know, largely speaking in a broader perspective, there is liquidated damages. Liquidated damages means a certain damages. A certain damages are damages where the parties decide among themselves and say that, you know, if there is a harm that is committed or in case there's a problem, then you pay me, you know, say, um, say around 50,000, you know, I don't know, drams or whatever is the currency. So, so and so amount. So that is a certain damages when the, dam when the parties are certain the damage or agree for the compensation that needs to be paid in case there is a harm that is inflicted. Now, what is unliquidated damages? Unliquidated damages are damages which are ascertained by the courts, which are decided by the courts, which is calculated by the courts depending upon the facts and circumstances of each case and depending upon palpable damages or tangible damages, what the court really assesses and thinks it is right in uh, you know, certain circumstances that can be avoided. So unliquidated damages are damages that are avoided by the court. Next is pecuniary damages. Pecuniary, I mean, the meaning of the word is something related to money. So pecuniary damages are damages that mostly aims at compensation in terms, you know, monetary compensation or monetary damages. Next is punitive damages. Punitive, by the word punitive, means that immediately should come to your mind that something related to penalty. You know, something related to punishment. So punitive damages or penalty, it's also called as exemplary damages, uh, which is in pecuniary terms, that is in money terms, such as fines. And it is imposed basically to deter future commission of tort, deter in the sense to lay a kind of an example to others and even to the person saying that in case you commit this tort, you will, you know, so, so, such and such a fine you has to be paid by you. So the person normally says that if I have to do away with so much of money, I'd rather not commit this 
taught again. So that is to deter a person that this may be in the form of punishment or to penalize the tort feeser. Next is substantial damages. Substantial damages are awarded when the plaintiff is compensated for the exact loss suffered as a result of infliction of a particular tort. That means a court would see the exact loss that is suffered. It would calculate the exact loss, nothing more, nothing less. So, you know, that, that is called as substantial damages. Next, we have nominal damages. These damages are awarded when the plaintiff's legal right is infringed, but there is no real tangible loss that has been caused or that can be calculated. In such case, the courts may charge the tort feeser to pay nominal damages for the act of tort committed to the agreed party or plaintiff, for example, trespass of property. It's actionable per se, but you know something cannot be really calculated. Now, how much would you calculate for trespass? So the court would think, okay, nominal damages. Next is contemptuous damages or ignominious damages, which is awarded by the court, uh, you know, as a sign of, uh, you know, expressing its disapproval of some act of the plaintiff. So, you know, the plaintiff also has not played it well, or he is not really in the right standing. The plaintiff also has committed some kind of a wrong, and he is not having a clear conscience or has not made a legitimate move while he was dealing with the tort before he filed the case. So the court basically to express its disapproval or, you know, in the sense that it does not like the act of the plaintiff that is the aggrieved party, the one who is affected by the tort and the one who has filed the case, just to you know, express its disapproval, uh, to show that you also have not been in the right standing. So in such cases, you know, an ignominious amount that is a very humble or very low amount may be awarded by the court to the plaintiff to be paid by the defendant saying that, well, you were also uh, not right. And uh, it's not that he was responsible for the tort, but probably his actions were not legitimate before. It can be any action. They were not legitimate. So the court would say, well, you see, um, your actions also were not legitimate enough. So we'll just award some kind of, you know, say a humble amount, a very small amount or ignominious amount or contemptuous amount. That is basically for uh, the court does it when it wants to show its disapproval. Next is moral damages. Now, moral damages, sometimes uh, it's normally in employment cases. Sometimes they, you know, they claim such damages when there is oppressive behavior of the employer towards the employee. It may entitle an, em em an employee to moral damages. Now, the next thing is injunction. What is injunction? As I said earlier, cease and desist order from the court, or it's also called as a stay order in lay terms. Now, what injunction does is it prohibits the tort feeser from continuing with the wrongful act. Example, like blocking third party's gate. Third party can bring an injunction order and further order to clear the path. So injunction is basically an equitable relief. Now, injunction may be a permanent injunction that is like forever or temporary interim or interlocutory injunction. That means uh, while the case is going on, while the case is adjudicated, you know, before the rights of the parties are proved, the court, you know, the, the, the lawyer may file a petition, an interim petition for, you know, interlocutory injunction, that means interim, that is in between, interlocutory means in between, you know, interim, in between a, a, a case, in between a case, sometimes they file, a, you know, interlocutory application for, uh, you know, uh, interim or interlocutory injunction. Next is mandatory injunction, that is the where the law itself gives the right it, it mandates for, for such an injunction and next is prohibitory injunction by the term you understand something that prohibits that means to prohibit a person the court may you know issue cease and desist order or an injunction order next is restitution now when a person is unlawfully dispossessed of his or her property or goods, then he or she is entitled to restoration of that property. Example, returning stolen objects. That is to, to restitution means to return something that belongs to someone else. So the court may ask a person to restore the property back to the person from whom you have taken it. So restitution. Next is specific performance. Now this you're going to study, probably if you're going to study the law of contract and uh, 
or I am not sure whether you've already learned it. So a specific performance for when the court feels justified that in, uh, there's a P missing here. In particular case, monetary damages wouldn't suffice in the pursuit of justice in the facts and circumstances of a particular case at hand. So the court may order for specific performance. Example, return the possession of property to a person who is wrongfully dispossessed. Example, the person is thrown out of the house. They'll say, no, no, you, the person does not have any other place to stay. Bring the person back into the house. Then we will decide about the rights of the person. Then yet another ex example could be that uh, by asking a party under a contract, when there are contractual terms as a contract between parties to perform his part of contractual obligation while the court decides about you know, who's right, who's wrong. So that, that calls for specific performance. Next is remoteness of damages. This also we studied in the chapter of negligence. Remoteness of damages or the way it is connected. So the damage inflicted should be directly related to the cause of the damage to be entitled to damages. That means the harm that is inflicted should be directly related to the cause of the damage to be entitled to compensation. So damages is the compensation that is adjudicated to be paid by the defendant to the plaintiff and it will be awarded when it is proved that the act of the omission of the defendant has had direct relationship or direct nexus to the damage caused to the defendant. So here, the factor of causation, remember we discussed about the causation theory. This is the very same thing. The factor of causation, that is the, the relationship between the cause and effect will have to be examined and tested here. So the relationship between the cause of damage and the effect of the, dam of the damage itself must be direct and not remote. Thereby, it is not enough if there is a damage cause. The damage cause should be as a direct result of the wrongful act or omission of the defendant. Now, the relationship as direct or remote can be examined also through the lens of the fact of foreseeability. Remember, we spoke about foreseeability. That means whether the the harm was foreseeable or was not foreseeable or the damage was foreseeable or not foreseeable now remember again i'm reminding you i'm using the word damage there is difference between the word damage and damages damages is compensation damage is the harm that is inflicted so whether now the harm or the damage was foreseeable or not foreseeable. In case we get disconnected, please join back. Next is, uh, we already did this case, Smith versus Leash Brian. If you remember that, uh, you know, the employee's, uh, you know, lip got burnt while he was pursuing some duties. And uh, when he, he had a burnt lip that, you know, it triggered the precancerous cells and it was activated. And as a result, Smith died from cancer three years later. And then his widow sued this company or the person, the employer, Leash Bryan. And the court said that damages can be awarded although the malady, that is a sickness, was unforeseeable. It was sufficient that the injury or the burn was reasonably foreseeable. So Justice Parker said here that the test is not whether these employers could reasonably have foreseen that a burn would cause cancer and that the victim would die. The question is whether these employers could reasonably foresee the type of injury he suffered, namely the burn, whether it was possible that they could foresee that a person can get burnt. So what in the particular case is the amount of damage which he suffers as a result of that burn depends upon the characteristics and the constitution of the victim. That means it depends upon the person's body, the person's physical, uh, whatever, strength or, uh, you know, the, the medical state of a person. So it's not the question of cancer, but it's a question of that he has, he has uh, you know, faced that burn and he has suffered that burnt lip. So that is a question whether the, the employer could foresee that that burn could take place or not. Now, there are four factors that need to be connected or questions that need to be asked when you solve a case of, you know, generally a tort and also a tort of negligence. One is, does the defendant owe a duty of care? That is reasonability. Now, if it is in the affirmative, that is, if it is yes, then has there been a breach of that duty on the part of the defendant? That is foreseeability of the risk. 
Next, has the damage been caused to the plaintiff? That means whether there has been real damages that is caused, what is the you know, nexus or the relationship between the foreseeability factor and the, uh, the proximity of the damage that has been caused? And next is, are there any defenses that are available to the defendant? So these are the questions that has to pop up in the mind of a person to, you know, to solve the case and to arrive at, uh, you know, a plausible conclusion or a formidable conclusion. Next is the defenses under thought. Now, what are the defenses for the defendant? Uh, so how can he defend himself saying that he is not really responsible? Some of it we have already done when we were learning negligence. So of course, the first one is contributory negligence, which we already did. Next is voluntary assumption of risk, voluntary non-fit injuria. Next is uh, vicarious liability. This also we did, but we'll repeat it again. Apart from that, which we have not done earlier is, because these are general defenses under the, the law of tort, and we did the three defenses under negligence. So four to seven, we'll go in detail today. Inevitable accident. Uh, inevitable accident, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, you can bifurcate it as, you know, act of God and human intervention. Uh, we'll do it later. Next is necessity, private defense, and plaintiff as a wrongdoer. We'll see what are these. We'll go to contrary between negligence as well. Now, there is a partial defense where the defendant claims that the plaintiff claimant or petitioner acted in a way to contribute to the injury sustained a loss damage. That means he also has a part in that damage that is caused. So now the courts would basically here uh, evaluate or assess the damages, taking into consideration the role played by the plaintiff that caused the damage, as well as the role played by the, uh, the defendant that has caused the damage and accordingly attribute it and appropriate the damages in such a way that justice is served and would deduct plaintiffs, you know, the role that he plays, which has caused the damage, they would assess it, it, assess it in their wisdom and they would deduct, say, minus that amount and pay the balance, uh, you know, uh, ask the defendant to pay the balance to the plaintiff. So that is contributory negligence. So it is basically concerned where there is plaintiff's failure also to take precaution and the burden or the onus lies on the defendant to prove this. We did this already. So I'm just rushing through. Next is voluntary non-fit injuria. We did this as well. That is voluntary assumption of risk where the person on their own assumes that risk. I gave an example about, uh, you know, these, um, these car racers, you know, people who participate in car racing, you know, they know that if there is a crash, that means uh, there is high probability of even losing life or limb. But, you know, they, they sign a contract, uh, for whoever they are, uh, you know, you know, on whose behalf they are racing the car for or whatever, and or even horse riding for that matter. So they know there is the possibility of being injured or even cricket game or any game for that matter. So they know about it, that th there is a possibility of some hurt or injury or some harm that may be caused. So, you know, that comes under voluntary non-fit injury, whether, you know, the defendant, uh, needs to establish the evidence that the plaintiff was fully aware of the consequence and was determined to engage in the endangering activity, exposing him or herself to the risk involved and damages are now claimed from the defendant. Now in the example that I gave, the car racing example, now if uh, like say, God forbid, there is an accident. So the, you know, the racer or the car driver will be the, you know, the plaintiff in the case he might file against the person who hires him for that purpose for the racing and he might claim the damages from them so the the company would say that well you are already aware of you know the risks that are involved in the game however but there are uh, you know different contractual terms uh, whenever uh, any person signs a contract whether it's for racing or whatever game i mean the, the contractual terms are quite uh, you know they're craftily, uh, you know, drafted in a way that would benefit even the, I mean, both the parties. 
but uh, the problem comes when it is lopsided or when it is only one sided so that's that's a reason one has to re read the agreements but people who are in the game they know it better and uh, normally they're not much hassles but however if there are such kind of situations then they have the defense the the um, defendant so in our example the car the the you know the car company or whoever the racer is representing you know they have the uh, the defense of voluntary non-fit injury injuria that the person has uh, you know well knowledge that there is a probability and a possibility of getting hurt or injured in case there is an accident you know owing to the 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 speed that they drive while racing next is therefore in the law of tort it is validly held that no person who has voluntarily waived or abandoned the right can enforce that right later so in latin voluntary non fit injuria literally means to a willing person injury is not done now this example or the case law blake versus galloway i already explained to you earlier so i will just cross this over next is vicarious liability or respondent superior that means imputed liability now i gave you an example last time where there is an employer uh, i remember i told you about um, a company who has a you know a driver and he drives the car and meets with an accident so the company is vicariously liable for the harm done uh, 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 harm caused to the people when he engaged when he you know he met with an accident so here it is an employer is vicariously liable for the harm done by the employee in the course of his employment or this also can be in case of principal and agent so this is vicarious liability which we also did and i also gave a brief reference about english law and uh, somalia also where i said that it comes under the somali civil code this particular article 171 I told you last time when we studied uh, negligence, it's the same thing here. Now we go to inevitable accident. This is something which we have not done. Now, inevitable accident, inevitable means something that, you know, cannot be missed or something that has to happen. Inevitable, that is just inevitable. It means you cannot, you know, um, you cannot avoid that, unavoidable. 